Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. I'm a 28-year-old guy who used to love hiking and outdoor adventures. About a year ago, I was in a terrible car accident that left me paralyzed from the waist down. It's been a tough journey, but I've been working hard in physical therapy and slowly regaining some independence. Last weekend, I decided to visit the local park for the first time since my accident. My physical therapist thought it would be good for me to get some fresh air and practice, maneuvering my wheelchair in a different environment. I was nervous but excited to be out and about again. As I was rolling along the path, enjoying the sunshine and the smell of freshly cut grass, I heard a shrill voice behind me. A woman was calling out to me referring to me as the one in the wheelchair. I turned around to see a woman in her 40s. She was pushing a stroller with a kid who looked about five or six years old. I asked if I could help her, and that's when things got weird. She explained that her child was tired of walking and asked if I could let him use my wheelchair for a bit. I was stunned. I tried to explain politely that my wheelchair wasn't a toy, but a medical device I needed to move around. She didn't take that well. She insisted it would only be for a little while and suggested that since I looked young and healthy, I could surely walk for a bit. I took a deep breath, trying to stay calm, and explained that I was paralyzed from the waist down and couldn't walk at all. I told her the wheelchair was my only means of movement. The woman accused me of lying, claiming she had seen people like me before, pretending to be disabled for special treatment. She said her son deserved to have some fun and called me selfish. At this point, her kid started whining. The child demanded to ride in the wheelchair and told his mother to make me get out. The woman used her child's reaction to further pressure me, accusing me of making her child cry and being inconsiderate. I was getting angry now, but I tried to keep my cool. I attempted to make her understand that while her child might be tired, my wheelchair wasn't a ride. I explained that it was essentially my legs and that I couldn't just get out of it. The woman dismissed my explanation calling me dramatic. She argued that it was just a chair with wheels and even claimed that her taxes probably paid for it, so it technically belonged to everyone. That was it. I'd had enough. I told her that I had paid for the wheelchair myself and pointed out how astounding her lack of understanding and empathy was. I asked her if she would ask someone to remove their prosthetic legs so her kid could play with it. She tried to argue that prosthetic legs were different because they were attached while my wheelchair wasn't part of my body. I countered by saying that it might as well be as I couldn't move without it. I then warned her that I would call security if she didn't leave me alone. The woman became indignant, accusing me of threatening her and declaring that she would report me for discriminating against her child. At this point, a few other people in the park had noticed the commotion and came over to see what was happening. One bystander asked if everything was okay, and I explained the situation. The onlookers were visibly shocked. Another bystander addressed the woman, telling her that her behavior was completely inappropriate and that she couldn't ask someone to give up their mobility aid. The woman angrily told them to mind their own business, insisting this was between her and me. A park security guard then approached and asked what was going on. I explained the situation to the guard who looked both concerned and annoyed. The guard then informed the woman that she would have to leave the park, explaining that Harassing visitors and demanding they give up medical equipment was not allowed. The woman protested, claiming she was a taxpayer with rights. The security guard clarified that her rights didn't include harassing people with disabilities and warned her that if she didn't leave immediately, the police would be called. Finally, the woman agreed to leave, but not without complaining that the park was terrible anyway. As she took off, pushing her stroller aggressively, I heard her mutter something about entitled disabled people. The security guard then turned to me, apologizing for what had happened and asking if I was okay. I assured him I was fine, just a bit shaken up, and thanked him for stepping in. I decided to make these park visits a regular thing. I won't let one bad experience with an entitled parent ruin my enjoyment of the outdoors. I've been working at this little coffee shop for about two years now. It's a cozy place with a giant teddy bear statue out front that's become something of a local landmark. People love taking selfies with it, and it's our unofficial mascot. Anyway, I was working the morning shift as usual. 
It was a busy day, and we'd just run out of our special caramel thunderbolt syrup. This lady walks in, decked out in fancy clothes and sunglasses, tapping away on her phone. She struts up to the counter like she owns the place. Karen ordered her usual drink, a large caramel thunderbolt with extra whipped cream and three pumps of vanilla. I apologetically informed her that we were out of the caramel thunderbolt syrup and offered to suggest an alternative. Her head snaps up from her phone and she looks at me like I've just insulted her entire family. Karen demanded to know if I knew who she was. I tried to apologize again and offer a similar drink, but she wouldn't hear it. She insisted on having her caramel thunderbolt, expressing her outrage at us running out of her favorite drink despite her daily visits. She starts yelling, causing a scene. My coworker tries to calm her down, but she's having none of it. Karen loudly demanded to speak with the manager. Our manager comes out, trying to smooth things over, but this lady is on a rampage. Karen declared us all incompetent and threatened to teach us a lesson. Before we can react, she storms out. About ten minutes later, we hear a commotion outside. I peek out the window and nearly choke on my own spit. This crazy lady is trying to drag our bear statue across the sidewalk. She's got it halfway to her car, grunting and sweating. My manager runs out to stop her, but she somehow manages to shove the bear into her SUV and speeds off, leaving us all slack-jawed on the sidewalk. We call the police, explaining the situation. They seem skeptical at first, but then we show them the security footage. Within an hour, they've tracked her down to her house in the suburbs. Now, this is where things get really wild. The police surround her house, and she starts live-streaming on social media from inside. On the live stream, Karen announced that she had taken the coffee shop's bear hostage. She demanded a lifetime supply of caramel thunderbolts and VIP treatment, threatening to harm the bear if her demands weren't met. She's waving around a pair of scissors, threatening to give the bear a haircut. The police try negotiating, but she's not budging. That's when they call in the special weapons and tactics team. I'm watching all this unfold on the news at the coffee shop, completely dumbfounded. How did my ordinary day turn into this? The SWAT team arrives, complete with a helicopter circling overhead. It's like something out of an action movie, except it's all over a coffee drink and a stuffed bear. A SWAT officer used a megaphone to ask Karen to come out with her hands up and release the bear, promising a peaceful resolution. Karen shouted back from a window, refusing to comply until her demands were met. She's still live-streaming, and now it's gone viral. People are tuning in from all over the world to watch this ridiculous standoff. Just when we think it can't get any crazier, the impossible happens. The bear moves on its own. Karen started screaming on the live stream, exclaiming in shock that the bear was alive. We're all watching as the bear statue, which has always been just that, a statue, starts lumbering around her living room. Karen is shrieking, running from room to room, while this giant teddy bear chases her. It turns out the bear was actually a guy in a costume. He'd been part of a secret marketing campaign our coffee shop was planning, and he'd been hiding inside the statue, and this was his first day, waiting for the right moment to reveal himself. When he realized he'd been kidnapped, he decided to take matters into his own hands. The bear man bursts out of the front door, with Karen hot on his heels, right into the arms of the waiting SWAT team. They're all so confused that for a moment, nobody moves. Karen takes advantage of this and makes a run for it, but she doesn't get far before tripping over her own high heels and face-planting on her perfectly manicured lawn. As the police cuff her and read her rights, she's still yelling about her caramel thunderbolt. The bear man is being interviewed by news crews, and my co-workers and I are trying to process what just happened. Karen got charged with theft, vandalism, and a whole bunch of other things. Our bear mascot became an overnight sensation, and the coffee shop has never been busier. We even renamed the Caramel Thunderbolt to the Bear Necessities, in honor of our heroic mascot. Let me tell you, after all that, I don't think I'll ever look at a teddy bear the same way again. I've always been a bit of a troublemaker, according to my parents. They say I have too much energy and not enough focus, but I like to think I just see the world differently. When the new principal arrived, I figured it was my chance to turn over a new leaf. Maybe this would be the year I'd finally fit in. The first day of school, we all gathered in the auditorium for the welcome assembly. The new principal stood at the podium, looking like he'd swallowed a lemon. He introduced himself as our new principal, 
and told us he had found our school lacking in discipline and order. He announced that there would be changes from that day forward. We all looked at each other, confused. What changes? Our school wasn't perfect, but it wasn't that bad. The principal then declared that recess was canceled, claiming it was a waste of valuable learning time. A collective gasp went through the auditorium. We couldn't believe it. No recess. Was he serious? He continued stating that there would be no more unnecessary noise in the hallways, including talking and laughing. No laughing? In a school? Finally, he announced that all students would wear gray uniforms, banning any distracting colors. That was the last straw. I stood up shouting that he couldn't do that, that we were kids, not robots. The principal's eyes locked onto me, cold and stern. He ordered me to sit down immediately, stating that this wasn't a democracy and that these rules were for our own good. I sat down, fuming. This couldn't be happening. As we filed out of the auditorium, my best friend nudged me and asked what we were going to do. I shook my head. I didn't know, but I knew we had to do something. The next few weeks were like living in a dystopian novel. We walked in perfect lines, spoke in whispers, and wore our dull gray uniforms. The hallways, once filled with laughter and chatter, were now silent as a graveyard. But the principal wasn't done. One morning, he made another announcement over the intercom. He said he'd noticed a disturbing lack of seriousness in the school. Therefore, he was introducing a mandatory sadness hour. Every day we would sit in silence and reflect on life's struggles. That was it. The final straw. I couldn't take it anymore. During lunch, I gathered a group of my closest friends. I told them we had to do something, that this wasn't school anymore, but prison. One friend asked what we could do, pointing out that he was the principal. I suggested we needed to show him that we weren't just going to roll over and take this. We needed a revolution. Another friend questioned if I was crazy. I admitted that maybe I was, but argued it was better than living like this. We spent the next week planning in secret. We passed notes, whispered in bathrooms, and used every opportunity we could to spread the word. Our plan was simple but effective. On the day of our revolution, everything seemed normal. We filed into the auditorium for the weekly assembly, gray and silent as usual. The principal stood at the podium, a smug smile on his face. He expressed his pleasure at how well we had adapted to the new rules, praising our obedience. That was our cue. I stood up, my heart pounding, and yelled, Now! Suddenly, the auditorium exploded with color. Students ripped off their gray uniforms to reveal bright clothes underneath. Laughter and cheers filled the air. Someone turned on music and people started dancing in the aisles. The principal demanded we stop at once, insisting on order, but no one was listening to him anymore. Parents, who we had secretly contacted, burst into the auditorium. They had banners and signs demanding the principal's resignation. One parent shouted that they wouldn't let him turn their children into mindless drones. The principal tried to regain control, but it was too late. The school board representatives, whom we had also invited, stepped in. A board member informed the principal that they had received numerous complaints about his leadership and would be conducting a full investigation. Eventually, things slowly returned to normal. We got a new principal who actually listened to us. Recess was reinstated, laughter returned to the hallways, and our colorful clothes made a comeback. I learned that sometimes being a troublemaker isn't such a bad thing. Sometimes, it's exactly what's needed to make things right. I've run this car dealership for over 20 years. It started when I was a mechanic fixing all kinds of cars. I learned everything about different makes and models. After many years, I saved enough to open my own dealership. It was hard work, but I built it from nothing. I always made sure to offer honest deals and good service. Six months ago, a woman came looking for a used car. She test drove a few and chose a five-year-old sedan. The car was in great shape, had low mileage, and we had checked it thoroughly. She seemed happy with her purchase. We talked about the warranty, which covered major parts for 90 days. She left smiling, and I thought everything was fine. Three months later, she came back very angry. She demanded to speak to the owner. When I said I was the owner, she shouted that the car I sold her was a lemon. She said it had broken down and wanted a free lifetime warranty. I asked what was wrong. She yelled that the engine light had come on and said, a car this new shouldn't have problems. 
I tried to explain that a check engine light doesn't always mean the car is broken. I offered to have our mechanics look at it for free, but she refused and kept demanding a lifetime warranty. I tried to reason with her, saying no car is guaranteed to never need repairs. She wouldn't listen and threatened to tell everyone we were dishonest. The next day, she was outside with a big sign saying, We ruin people's lives. She had five others with her, all holding signs. She said they'd keep protesting until we gave her the lifetime warranty. Things got weirder. A van showed up with News 7 on it. A fake reporter asked me about selling bad cars on purpose. I realized the woman had hired actors to pretend to be news people. For weeks, she came every day with her fake protesters and news crew. She gave out flyers with lies about our business to our customers. This scared people away from buying cars. I tried talking to her many times. I offered to fix any real problems with her car, but she wouldn't listen. She said we needed to rebuild the whole car from scratch. When I said we couldn't do that, she threatened to keep protesting until we closed down. I was desperate. Then my longtime mechanic had a great idea. The next day, I told the woman we'd give her what she wanted, a brand new car built from scratch in our shop. She looked happy, thinking she'd won. She didn't know our plan. For a week, we put on a show. We set up a special area, brought in fancy-looking tools, and pretended to build her car. We were just moving parts around and making noise. We told the local police what was happening. They helped by putting up signs saying they were watching to make sure we were being fair. The woman stopped her protests. She told everyone she'd beaten a big company. After a week, we showed her the new car. It was actually her old car, cleaned up with a few small fixes. We said we'd built it just for her, with a lifetime warranty. I gave her a warranty card. In small print, it said the warranty only worked if she never drove the car because using the car might cause wear and tear. She drove away happy, thinking she'd won. Later, I heard she was trying to sell her custom-built car for 10 times its value. I almost felt bad for anyone who believed her story. Almost. It wasn't just about the car or the warranty. It was about finding a way to stop the damage to our business and reputation. In the end, we found a solution that made everyone happy, even if it wasn't exactly what it seemed. The whole situation was stressful, but it showed me how important it is to stay calm and think outside the box when facing difficult customers. Sometimes giving people what they think they want rather than what they're asking for can be the best way to resolve a conflict. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.